really hard for me to figure out where to begin, but my wife likes to say it's a lot more difficult for me to end. Um, really, I, I have to make two apologies before I start. I'm Jewish. We got guilt complexes. You know, guilt. Uh, number one is uh, when I was up on Har Bracha, because my wife and I speak to all of HaYovel, the, the planters, the... Uh, the harvesters, can I do this in Hebrew? Much easier. The harvesters, the, no, I didn't say tongues. I said Hebrew, no. The, uh, the harvesters and the pruners, and I forgot to recognize, acknowledge the magnificent seven that came from Beit Tehila up to Hayovel. Um, that's number one. Number two, I made what I consider to be the biggest gaffe in the 25 years that I've been speaking to you folk, the missus came in today. And I didn't recognize her. I asked her who she was. And I am still horrified. But here's the deal. I have read a lot about Christianity, and I have taken the best that you have to offer. And I know you've got no choice. You have to extend grace to me. <laughs> okay, I mean, this is an on fire crowd. And um, I'm just acknowledging we started at a quarter to 12, quarter to eight. And um, yeah, so I just want to, what I usually do is I usually like, like tell a joke to see where the crowd is. Well, I don't have to tell a joke to see where this crowd is, but I have to tell the joke anyway. Um, and I want you to know that this is not a sexist joke. It's just Jewish humor. So an elderly couple from New York go to Israel. And while they're in Israel, the wife passes away. And so the Hevra Kedisha, that's our burial society, comes up to the husband and says, you have two choices of what to do with your wife's body. You can either send her back to New York, and it'll cost you $5,000, or you can have her buried here in the Kedusha, the holiness of the Holy Land. It'll cost you absolutely nothing. So the man doesn't hesitate and says, I want to send my wife back to Brooklyn. And he says, I don't understand. The undertaker says, I don't understand. Why would you spend that kind of money to send your wife's body back when she could be buried here in the holiness of Eretz Israel for free? And the man says, well, you see, a long time ago, a nice Jewish man died and three days later rose from the dead. <laughs> I cannot take a chance of this happening with my wife. <laughs> Believe me, there is so much more of that. Okay. First of all, um, I'm going to blame your pastor because we've been spending so much time together and we've gotten to know each other so well and he feeds me nonstop. So I don't know what, whether you want to make me healthy or kill me. <laughs> he calls it hospitality. Anyhow, and I'm just like blown away. It's never happened before and I've spoken in hundreds, maybe thousands of places. I go up, pull up to fill my gas tank the other day before I can even get out of the car. His credit card is in that automated machine in order to pay it. I'm like, what are you doing? He says, you're our guests. And so I have created a very long list <laughs> of if you decide. No, I'm just kidding. Look, it, I, something's going on in the world because I can tell you that even 10 years ago, I couldn't beg, borrow, or steal to speak in a, can I even call it a, a, a messianic congregation? Now there are just so many definitions. Okay, I'm not this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm not that. I mean, people here, it doesn't matter. 
you're all on Noah's Ark with me. Okay? The bottom line is <laughs> you've chosen the right ship to sail with. And, 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 and I, I can only tell you that it will be, even though God said he would never, ever destroy the world again through a flood, I don't know. I don't know. We live in a pretty evil world. But whatever it is, you're welcome on my ship. And it's about time it's taken us two thousand years to get here. And when the animals come on board, there are a couple animals that I'm going to just tell God. See, we Jews, we negotiate with God. Okay? Okay. Oh, you say that? Well, I don't like that. Well, what about this, that? It's very uh, ordinary for us to negotiate with God. Okay? We don't accept anything at face value. We are the most difficult, stiff-necked people you will ever meet. And, 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 but I don't, when the, if the animals ever come on board the ark, no scorpions. Because two weeks ago in my bed, I got stung by a scorpion. Uh-huh. And we were looking for him frantically for like four days, finally found it. What does my wife do because she doesn't kill animals? She traps it and puts it outside. I said, it's not good enough that he, he, he bit me? You got to let him go free? Okay. Look at, we, wherever I go, I always plug Hayoveo. I always plug another organization because it was only until 10 years ago whenever anyone would ask me, so what can I do for Israel other than give money? And I was mum. I couldn't give an answer because the truth of the matter is Israel didn't want you to be there. And what Hayoveo and the other ministry called Aliyah Restoration is doing is groundbreaking because so many people come to Israel and they go in the footsteps of Jesus 30 times and they never meet the real Israel, which is us. And when you meet us, the ground shakes. And I'm glad I got my security man here. By the way, is everybody here pro-Israel? I look around very carefully. Are there any terrorists in the audience? If so, could you please stand up and identify yourself so we can shoot you? And I want to tell you about my first two experiences with Christianity. When I was about seven years old, and I was taking my books to whatever it was, second, third grade, you know, this was before they had backpacks. <laughs> I see some smiling faces. And we would carry our books like this, and if, God forbid, one of them fell out, well, how am I going to pick it up? Got to drop these. As soon as I move this arm, those are going to drop out. I mean, it was a major dilemma, and then some genius came along and created a backpack. And here I am. There's a Catholic school right across the street from me, and these three big guys come along, come up to me, push the books out of my arms, and say, hey, you dirty kike, you killed my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then my best friend, Ron Hansen, I used to go over there after school. We used to play Civil War. We had gray soldiers. We had blue soldiers, Confederate against the Union. Um, I better adapt this story, the winner, according to where I am in America. And, and, and we'd throw the die and say I got a five and he got a three. That meant five of his guys went down. Three of my guys went down. I won the game. As soon as I won the game, you 
gets into this hysteria, and he starts screaming. Mom, and his mother's upstairs, going up the stairs, Mama, 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 Mama. He killed my army just the way he killed Jesus. Let me tell you, much of the church hasn't changed. The problem is, I don't think they're reading their Bible. Because I've read through the New Testament several times. I think there are some great teachings there. And you know, two of the greatest teachings that I love, number one, to these the least of my brethren ye have done unto me. My, oh, gee whiz. I read through that and I said, Yo, man, that doesn't. Ref there were no Christians then. His brothers were all Jews. And number two, that beautiful scripture where it says, I give my life willingly. For what? Not to blame anyone, but to create reconciliation, peace among men. You are truly absolutely without a doubt the exception and my prayer is that you grow exponentially okay let's take a look at the bible because it's totally cool here's the other return dot okay if you don't know about these ministries go there you know how often do you hear people say there are two sides to every story Let me tell you something. There are not two sides to every story. Anyone who says that there are two sides to every story lacks the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. I get very passionate. Lacks the ability to tell the difference between dark and light. Because in this conflict, there is no symmetry. It is an asymmetrical conflict. There is one side that abides by the laws of humanity. There is another side that is lawless. We stand in front of our citizens. We even stand in front of their citizens to protect them. They use their citizens as human shields. <laughs> Did any of you know that the leader of Hamas in Gaza, his wife and two of his children, their lives have been saved in Israeli hospitals? So people will sometimes come up to me and say, what are you people doing? Saving the lives of your bitter enemies? And I say, no, you're wrong. We must do that. Because that is the meaning of a light unto the nations. We must maintain a moral standard which sets an example for the entire world. The Bible. As my granddaughter loves to say, the Bible. Hosea, along with many others, prophesy that Israel will be dispersed out of the land, scattered all over the world. And they're not going to have a king, a prince, nor sacrifice, right? The temples have been destroyed. And then in a miraculous, miraculous happening, the prophets, God talks about, he's going to regather all these people from all the corners that they were scattered to with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. I mean, seriously, does God have to outstretch his arm? I mean, you know, it's a metaphor. What does it mean, my interpretation? God is stretching out his arm. is a way of saying the entire world has to see that this is an act of God. And then, 
every single day new immigrants come. Do you remember when the airport in Tel Aviv was closed down for a day or two during the last Gaza war? One of those days, <laughs> you just have to appreciate this stuff, an entire airplane of American Jews landed at Ben-Gurion Airport and made Aliyah move to Israel. Why is God doing it? Well, sometimes people say, oh, the answer, we know, you know, God's doing it for you, and we expect you to be pro-Israel and say good things about Israel. And I say, no, that's not what it says in the Bible. God is doing this miracle for the sake of, of all the nations, not for us. He's doing it to show the whole world that he is God. And this is really cool. Do you, do you still, I mean, that was a word like when I was a kid. Cool, you still use that? I'm going to challenge you. Any of you use mellow? Well, you have just aged yourself. Listen to this. He shall gather the lost of Israel and Judah. Separates the two. What does that mean? I'm a descendant of Judah. Jews. We lived homogeneously throughout the centuries, retained our identity. That's the southern tribe. Okay, not the northern tribe. And what we see today is only one sliver of the miracle. And here's the thing. I have come to the conclusion that people like you are the Meshuganas that are part of Israel. <laughs> because there's really no other logical conclusion why you're here and not in church on Sunday. Who has heard anything like this? Who saw anything like this? As a land born in one day, as a nation born at once, that Zion both experienced birth pangs and bore her children. Okay, you can hear. First of all, the Hebrew is much better. Eh, we'll do it with English. Okay. You can hear Isaiah laughing, saying, ha, ha, ha. You think that God can have a woman go through nine months of pregnancy birth, uh, whatever, uh, uh, labor and delivery in one day. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Even God, that's a little bit much for him. No, Isaiah is saying, God can do it. Okay? How many women have given birth here? Okay. Please, men, don't raise your hand. <laughs> I had that in Finland. And I said, I think we need another translator. And even though there was so much politics that led up to it, Israel, the United Nations, and Flushing Meadows, a vote was taken, and the nation, sovereign, sovereign modern nation of Israel was created in one day. And what's amazing is if the same vote were taken today, I guarantee you, we wouldn't get this many votes, but God put it on the hearts of the Gentile nations to vote for the establishment of Israel. Amazing. I'll say it in Hebrew. Ufaratsta yama kedma tzafona benegba. They're going to come back. And these are the large waves of immigrants that came back after the declaration of the state. And not to be misinformed, even though we were scattered in exile. There has always been a continuous presence throughout history of at least a small number of Jews. We have always remained connected in the land. But this blows my mind. I'm reading this for the first time in Hebrew. And what does it say about the north? It says, do not hold them back. What's he referring to? If you're in Israel... Where's north? Russia. Former Soviet Union. 
I have friends from the former Soviet Union who tell me they needed to get a travel permit just to travel from one town to another town. The Soviet Union was hermetically sealed. The communism, the dictatorship was, was, was so overwhelming. People almost couldn't breathe. What did God say? You can't hold them back. Starting in 1989, the Iron Curtain fell like butter. And guess what? God said, your time's over. And outflowed starting in 1989, more than a million Jews from the former Soviet Union. I mean, this stuff is like seriously good. And then what about you've got, I, I, lo I love the accusation Israel being an apartheid nation. Serious, like, folks. <laughs> we have every color. We have every ethnic group. We've got every language. We got it all. We are the melting pot that never melted. How are we going to all communicate? Because we come from so many different cultures, so many different backgrounds, so many different languages. Our co the color of our skin is every shade that you can think of. Well, Zephaniah says, when they come home, when Israel takes root, I am going to convert them to a pure language. Well, if there's a pure language, the implication is that there must have been an impure language. Okay? And when the Jews of Europe traveled, Hebrew became mixed in with all the European languages, and an impure form of Hebrew was spoken for many centuries. And it's called Yiddish and Ladino. Well, do we speak Yiddish and Ladino in Israel? Okay. Do the Italians speak Latin in Rome? No. We speak Hebrew. And what are we going to use? Well, the euro, fortunately, wasn't around. It wasn't an option. We use the shekel. How many of you have not been to Israel? Those of you who have been to Israel, please keep your mouth shut. We're, we're going to auction this off today. This is biblical currency, okay? We are going to start this at $50,000. I'll compromise on that one. And this is the one that completely blows me away. <laughs> I shall settle you as in your early days and shall make you better than your beginnings, and you will know that I am the Lord. Here we go again. Whatever happens in that land is testimony that God is God. He's keeping a covenant he made thousands of years ago with a man by the name of Abraham. Five years in a row, I have taken groups of Christians to Auschwitz and Birkenau. Have any of you been? Okay. There's a spot in Birkenau, which was a death camp that had four enormous gas chambers and crematoria. And you can't, you just, I mean, when, the, when, when they knew that the Russians were coming, they, 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 the SS tried to blow them up. But still, what's left of the gas chambers and the crematoria are still there. And you can actually walk down the steps 
that hundreds of thousands of Jews walk down on their way to the gas chamber. You can't conceive of the evil. This spot right here, behind these four memorial stones, does this work here? No. See the shallow pit? There are two shallow pits. Those two shallow pits contain the ashen remains of about a million Jews. The day before I've gone every year, I've gone up to Har Bracha, the Mount of Blessing, and I've picked up, let's say there are 30 people in the group that come with me, I've picked up 30 stones. And when we get to that spot, you know, Jews put stones on graves to show that they remember, the people are remembered. Any phone that goes off, I get that because I have to buy two phones for my children while I'm here. <laughs> um, so just picture this. It, 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 I've got a group of 30 Christian friends from all over Europe. And one by one, they take a little stone from the bag. And they go up to the memorial stone. And they put it there. It is the most unifying experience that together, finally, as Christians and Jews, we can stand together and call evil what it is. And then we say several Tehillim, several Psalms, in whatever languages are represented in the group. We all are dealing with replacement theology. It is the seed of of anti-Semitism. And it's expressed in so many forms. Isaiah, I looked for a pasuk, a scripture, when I first went to this spot. And this is the scripture that came. Shall a woman forget her sucking child from having mercy in the child of her womb? In other words, can you conceive of living in a world which is so evil that a mother will forget to breastfeed her newborn child? Isaiah says, yes, even that. But it doesn't matter to what depths humanity sinks. I, God, will never Forget you, Israel. You, each one of you, are goodwill ambassadors. When somebody comes up to you and they throw replacement theology or anything negative about Israel in your face, okay, you can't act like an American and back away from confrontation, you have got to get in their face. You have got to speak the truth because you have become our arm. There is no greater moment that I have had in my life than standing on the tracks of Birkenau where over a million Jews were brought to their deaths in boxcars from all over Europe, standing there with my Christian friends on those tracks, waving our Israeli flags, putting up our passports high in the air, and declaring together, evil will never, ever, ever prevail because there are good people in this world.
Okay. Picture. Our son is an uh, Israeli tour guide. This is what Tel Aviv Yafo looked like in 1906. Does it look like it can support life? Where's water going to come from, building materials? How are we going to grow fruits and vegetables? But what are the promises that God made? Well, remember, he's going to make the cities better than they ever were. And that's why today, Tel Aviv looks like this. And this, and Jerusalem, during the day, during the day, Jerusalem at night, Okay? And that's why whenever any of you fly into Israel, you see the coastline. It's amazing. It's like an experience you've never, ever had before. This emotional zing or whatever it is just like pops up in you. <clears throat> and I'm one time, I'm, I'm, I'm on the right side of the plane, and the whole left side of the plane is a Christian group. And they all stand up when they see their lives. I'm surprised they didn't successfully push some of them out the window. And they all stand, and I stand up, and I say, hey, folks, there's like 200 people standing up looking out the window on the left side. Okay, Israeli pilots are good, but we can't land the plane like this. <laughs> That's the emotion. And it's the emotion that you feel because you go to that land, and what you read about in the Bible, it comes alive. Those whom came, whom Jacob caused to take root, Israel flourished and blossomed. They filled the face of the world with fruit. Everywhere on the shelves of Europe are Israeli fruits and vegetables. When my parents were living in San Diego, how are we doing with time? Too bad. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> San Diego, I went into an A&P every time I was there, and they have Israeli fruits and vegetables on the, on the shelves. They grow the same fruits and vegetables right up the street. You know how far it is from Israel? You know, you got to go through this canal, the Panama Canal, and the, this canal, and you got to go around here. It's like got to be about 12,000 nautical miles. And I asked the guy, you know, the merchant, the, the guy who puts out the merchandise, the guy that takes all the bad stuff, puts it on top, and takes the good stuff and puts it on the bottom. Okay. Why are you carrying fruits from Israel when they're right up the street? And he just shrugs his shoulder and he says, it's because my clients tell me the Israeli fruits and vegetables taste better. Why? Because those who came whom Jacob caused to take root Israel flourished and blossomed. They filled the face of the world with fruit. We take seemingly impossible situations and we turn them into challenges. Because that's the way the Jewish head works. We've been studying the genius of the Torah and the interpretations of the Torah for thousands of years. It has developed our minds. It's not because we're superior. It's because God mandated us to be a blessing to mankind. I mean, for heaven's sake, I just read an article yesterday that Israel has identified a certain bacteria within cancer cells which partially, if not completely, explains why chemotherapy works on some people and completely does not work on others. Israel's working on an immunization which will neutralize radiation in the human body. Desert and waste and shall rejoice over them, and the plain shall rejoice and shall blossom like a rose. One of my favorite pictures. Everybody know who this is? Of course. Yeah, well, a couple uh, months ago, I made a mistake. I said, Ann Rand. <laughs> yes, Ann Frank. She died in Bergen-Belsen right before the end of the war. And when I was in Bergen-Belsen, I picked up two of her pictures. I don't pass them around anymore because they're very delicate. And... Any of you been to Anne Frank, to the Frank home? Okay. And you walk through the home, and I don't know if those of you who were there, right around the corner there's a statue of Anne Frank. And I decided I wanted to do something special, so I went into a flower shop, and I got 18 
multi-color tulips. Why 18? Because it represents the Hebrew word chai for life. And the flower owner, whatever you call it, the, the shop owner comes out, magnificent bouquet of 18 multicolored tulips. And I said, it's really true. Holland is the tulip capital of the world. Looks at me straight in the face and he says, sir, this is not tulip season. We imported these tulips from Israel. Okay, look at that. I was going through some old pictures of my family the other day. This is my mother and father. God, I miss them. This is their first trip to Israel in 1968. At that time, this was the largest building in the Middle East, the Shalom Tower. Today, if you go there, you can't see it because there are about 500 other buildings that are taller. Because God said, you're going to rebuild your cities, they're going to be better than ever. And that's why I love going to Norway, because it is cold in January. Norway is one of the richest countries in the world. Their climate is harsh. They have to import their fruits and vegetables. So here I am in one of their supermarkets. All they have are eight fruits and vegetables. Three are from Spain. Five are from Israel. Red peppers, whatever color that is, it's been a source of debate. Um, uh, watermelons from Israel, grapefruit and oranges from Israel, because all year round, the fruits and vegetables look like this. And the flowers and the land that was desolate looks like this, and this, and this. This thing with Israel is not according to human logic. It's according to God's logic. The greatest empires in history, the most powerful military, they are all on the dustbin of history. The smallest nation, the most persecuted nation, survived because God had a plan, made a covenant with a man by the name of Abraham. And you and I are lucky enough to live in the era, in the time where it's being fulfilled. And being a light to the nations this Israeli soldier, she's feeding a Syrian baby who lost her parents in the Syrian civil war. Northern hospitals in northern Israel have treated upwards of 4,000 wounded Syrians, our mortal enemies. This She's an Iranian blogger who blogs something in an Israeli paper. And she had to leave Iran for fear of death. Guess where she got political asylum? You're darn right, in Israel. Folks, I want you to appreciate the resilience of the Jewish people. This statue is in Auschwitz. This is what was left of European Jewry, the ones that survived. You know who I think are the real heroes? The ones that lost their families. I can't conceive. I pray that I will go before my children or grandchildren. These people lost their families. And you know the true mark of heroism, they started a second family again. That's a real statement of faith and of strength and of hope. It doesn't matter how far we are put down, we always climb back up. And here, 
What do you see? The survivors of World War II, they're completely humiliated, skin and bone, barely any food, completely a sense of complete hopelessness. How in heaven's name did this in 1948 turn into this? How is it that they defended in 1948, three years after being the lowest of the low, come together and defend a tiny little sliver of land that was invaded by five armies. You know how? I'm going to say something radical here. You may hear about this from your pastor. I'm not like my wife. My wife has faith everything. Whatever happens good, whatever happens bad, okay, God has a reason. I'm a student of Jewish history. My mother lost her entire extended family in Dachau and Bergen-Belsen. The pain of knowing what happened runs so deep. Honestly, if it weren't for Israel, I don't know if I'd believe in God. And I thank, I thank God for living in this generation because I can point to one thing and probably if someone were to come up to you and say, prove to me that God exists. You may have one difficult time answering, but you can say, I can take you to the Bible, and I can take you to the land, and you can see God's manifestation. The scriptures just bounce off the pages, and that's the proof that we have a covenant-keeping God. And here's the thing with Israel that is so important. If God doesn't keep his covenant with Israel and return us to the land, what makes you think he's going to keep his covenant with you? We either have a covenant-keeping God or a non-covenant-keeping God. <sighs> but I have issues with all those that died. What is it that happened to all of those souls that are gone? I had that question for a long time until I went to Auschwitz and Birkenau and Buchenwald and all the other camps, and I realized something. Every time I drive my car up to Jerusalem, I've done it thousands of times, I still get chills up my back. Every time we're in a war, we win. Okay, yeah, okay, so it's a God thing, but it's more than a God thing. I discovered what it is, and it gave me an answer. Where are all those lost souls? Are they lost forever? No. Because now when I travel up the road to Jerusalem, I feel their presence. I feel I am carrying them with me. And that's why we don't fight and defend Israel like a nation of 6.3 million Jews. We defend the country with the memory and the strength of hundreds of millions of Jews who could not have the privilege that we have. Okay. <laughs> All right. Are you up for just a one more little story? Okay. Lock the doors. Take out the handcuffs. They can't leave. Um, a very good friend of ours, who's now retired, was in the Air Force, and he flew. Um, in the Lebanon War, he flew uh, whatever it was that picked up other soldiers. What is that called? Uh, Chinook or something? 
okay, whatever. What, yeah, and he also flew a fi- an F-15. And, and, and he used to come, uh, Israeli, a lot of Israeli pilots train in uh, New Mexico, Arizona with American pilots. And so one day, one of his best friends that he made with the Israeli, an, Israeli, uh, an American pilot, came to Israel, and he got permission to bring him onto the Air Force Base. And he climbed into the cockpit of an F-15, and he turned to my friend, and he said, what's this? He said, there's 60, 70% of the avionics that are in this place, that, is in this co- that are in this cockpit. I don't recognize. My friend said, well... I had a dilemma. I didn't know if I really wanted to ask you to come on because the truth of the matter is is that we've taken out 60-70% of the avionics that come with the F-15. We've replaced them with our avionics because ours are better. A nation of 6.3 versus a nation of 300 million? That's part of the inheritance that God gave us. Okay. But this is what we really want. And goodness, Lord, I can't wait until the northern kingdom comes back and joins us. (sighs) I'm going to warn you about Israeli drivers. They're mashuganas. And this. But you know what? I just want to show one video. I originally had three videos. Can you go to video number three? I love to tell the stories of righteous Gentiles. The ones who during World War II risked their lives, risked their families' lives in order to save Jews. I don't know if I could live up to that level of heroism. But there's this man by the name, maybe if some of you have heard it, our son and I like to take a trip to uh, European capital, a couple European capitals every two or three years. And we just happened to be in Prague. And we stayed at a hotel. We went to the, the, how do you say, the train station. And there was a statue there of a man together with holding a suitcase, holding a young, a young person and another very young uh, girl walking alongside him. It turns out this man um, saved the lives of over 600 Jewish children, falsified their documents, and they were sent to England and sent to Sweden, which was neutral during the war, instead of being sent north to Theresienstadt which is where they would have died. And today, the descendants of those 600-some-odd children number over 10,000. Folks, we live in an evil world. There are a lot of people. And it's very easy for us to say, what can one person do? Don't ever think that. We each have the capacity to do amazing things. So let's put on the video, please. children. This is Vera Dermont, now Vera Gissing. We did find her name on his list. Vera Gissing is with us here tonight. Hello, Vera. And uh, I should tell you that you are actually sitting next to Nicholas Winton. (laughs) And it was just so wonderful, so terribly, terribly touching. Anyone in our audience tonight who owes their life to Nicholas Winton? If so, could you stand up, please?
This shows you that one man has the capacity to do amazing things. Amazing things. It's in all of us. But to me, if we can go back to the um, PowerPoint. To me, this says it all. This says it all. That God has given us the resilience, the ability to climb out of the depths, to reach the highs. People sometimes say to me, Eliezer, doesn't it like get difficult to live in Israel, the terrorism, the this and the that? And if you look at the continuum of Jewish history, folks, I got to tell you something. We have never had it so good. I'm going to continue now with uh, my wife, a 20-minute presentation of her work. And before I do that, I just want to give you all a welcoming, welcome folks to the tribe. Eliezer and I were born and raised in Chicago. We decided to follow our hearts and our dream and come home to Israel with our children in 1983. Eliezer and I live in a tranquil community northwest of Jerusalem. My artwork reflects my love for my wonderful growing family and my love of living in Israel. I wake up in the morning and am blessed to take deep breaths of the air of Israel and step outside and walk where our forefathers and mothers walked, perhaps even in the exact spot where they walked. I'm in awe of it and love every moment. As you can see, each piece of art here is imbued with scriptures. Each warms my heart spiritually, centering my soul, giving me a feeling of peace and home in our land, connecting and tying me to our biblical past while living in the present. Any piece of art you bring home with you can give you that same special feeling, speaking to you from your walls just as they do from mine. What is microcalligraphy? Calligraphy, writing, micro, that's very small. Using this tiny lettering, I create these flowing designs. A final creation is a picture completed entirely with words. I coined the term microcalligraphy to express my exacting work. Tiny letters and words blending together to form the design and figures on the paper. The original art form called micrography started in the 7th to 9th centuries in Israel in Tiberias by scribes known as Masoretim, traditionalists, as they kept track of the words they were working on while compiling the first Jewish concordancia, a book that lists every word and phrase, how many times it was written, and its location with proper pronunciation everywhere in scriptures. It was time-consuming work. To keep track of their progress, these scribes wrote these words in tiny lettering, in geometric shapes, in the margins of their paper, and voila, the original micrography. Throughout the centuries, this art form has developed from geometrical shapes to what you see today. My artwork has unique styles compared to other artists whose work is written in black ink creating black and white pictures, while some artists write in black ink on sections of watercolor paintings. I paint colorful words inscribed letter by letter using a calligraphy pen dipped into a spectrum of watercolor paints patiently, spending anywhere from one month to nearly a year creating an entire artistic composition. I also use gematria or Jewish numerology in my designs. In Hebrew, each letter of the alphabet possesses numerical value. The first letter, Aleph, equals one, Bet, two, etc. The word Chai, life, equals the number 18. 18 always signifies life. I use gematria to calculate the numerical equivalence of letters, words, or phrases written in my artwork. 
I also use Gematria to determine how many times I'll write the text for a specific piece. That also determines how tiny or very tiny I'll have to write. There are a lot of logistics involved in creating each composition. Some pieces take up to 11 months to create. This intertwining weaving of words in Jewish numerology adds deep spirituality to each of these particular images. Creating a composition with gematria, as far as I know, is a unique trait of my artwork. I've not seen it in other microcalligraphy artists' works. So, there's the colorful hand-painted writing and the gematria that creates something both artistically and spiritually uplifting. A question often asked is how I began doing microcalligraphy. Before this, I created soft sculptures of whimsical Hasidic figures and biblical and Israeli political characters. They are very popular both in Israel and around the world. But then I was given a new direction. One day I woke up and the need to do this descended and enveloped me. I understood that a gift was being shared with me. I also knew I was very busy and didn't have time for a new venture or adventure right then. So I pushed it out of mind. Two weeks later, friends from California called Eliezer. They wanted to start marketing biblical micrography in the U.S. and asked for his help locating sources in Israel. Hearing this conversation, I knew I was being given a second chance. I took it. How often do second chances come along? The rest, as you can see, is history. I took it and continued to take one step at a time, learning something new on this journey from each piece. I'm thankful every day for this wonderful blessing. It's a true gift. People are often interested in our life and lifestyle and how scriptures and these pictures connect to us today. I'll use the cycle of the year to help explain. Here's parting of the Red Sea, which reminds us of Passover and how we sit telling and retelling the story of the Exodus. This creation evolved by writing the entire book of Exodus. We're constantly connected to our past, feeling as though we were there by reliving and retelling the story every year, making it real for today. As you can see, I love what I do. I love living in Israel. Song of Solomon is the first of all of these microcalligraphy artworks that I created. It expresses God's love for his people. Song of Solomon is actually read on the Shabbat that falls during Passover. After Passover, we celebrate a holiday for modern day Israel. Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Israel's Independence Day. Here we have the design that combines the flag of Israel today with the outline of the map of today's Israel. It's created using the words of the Israeli national anthem, Hatikva, the hope. The focus of this image and the anthem is the land of Zion. Jerusalem is highlighted in the center with the Star of David created using the ancient walls of Jerusalem instead of the standard blue star. I wrote Hatikva, the Israeli national anthem, 156 times because the letters of the word Zion, Zion, break down letter by letter and equal the number 156. After celebrating Yom Ha'atzma'ut, we continue to the next holiday, Shavuot, or Pentecost. This piece is Tree of Life. Its design is created using the entire Book of Ruth. The flowers and the grass are the Book of Ruth, reaching King David here at the bottom of the tree under and supporting her roots. Here's an opportunity to explain the difference between my microcalligraphy artwork and other artists' micrography, who execute a watercolor painting of Ruth, cutting sheaves of wheat. The piece an entire watercolor painting. But where's the writing? Only Ruth's braid contains text, written in black ink. Perhaps the text continues in the border as well. A beautiful picture, but only a small portion with text. Here, the entire text is the composition, and the composition is the text. The tree trunk is filled with the words sung as the Torah scrolls are returned to the ark after the week's portion is read. She's a tree of life to those who hold on to her, and her supporters are joyous and given peace.
Encircling the entire tree is the blessing of Sarah, Rachel, Rebecca, and Leah that continues with a beautiful blessing for the entire family. Woman of Valor, the words of Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, create these biblical women. We start with the matriarch Sarah. Miriam is next to her, depicted singing praise to God after crossing through the parted Red Sea, the Passover story. After Passover, we fast approach the holiday of Shavuot, during which the book of Ruth is read in the synagogue Shavuot morning. Here is Ruth gathering sheaves of wheat. Continuing is Queen Esther. The story of Purim shines through her, a story of redemption. Purim is celebrated a few weeks before Passover. Then there's the prophetess Devorah, the fairest of judges and guiding light for all of us throughout history. May these women of valor bring a lifetime of continuing inspiration to each of us. It's written 30 times, 12 plus 18. 12, the age of girl begins her journey to become a woman of valor in her own right. Plus life, chai, 18. If you've been to Jerusalem, you've seen the beauty of what has been built or rebuilt But you know that the wall, the Kotel, is what remains after the destruction of the temple 2,000 years ago on the 9th of Av, the Jewish date that falls in July or August. Seventy names of Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, written in gold, hovers over the ancient western wall. Jerusalem has 70 different unique spiritual names. I wrote these names in glowing gold micro calligraphy to create the word Jerusalem here. May Jerusalem of gold be completely rebuilt soon in our days. The original of this design is actually an embroidered satchel that I made for our second son-in-law's prayer shawl, then created this artwork from it. Jerusalem Star of David, Psalms 122. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Psalms 126, verses from Zechariah and Isaiah and more. Isaiah 62, 1. I've set watchmen upon the walls of Jerusalem. Take no rest until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. This intricate piece depicts the rebuilt temple in the heart of the picture. Jerusalem, forever the center of the world, the center of our hearts. As you know, the Jewish year is a cycle. We've shared the holidays, starting here with Passover, reaching the saddest day, the ninth of Av, and the destruction of the temples. But then our attention turns again to joy and new beginnings, a new year, Rosh Hashanah, that will, God willing, bring us many blessings. Verses from the deep, heartfelt prayers recited on Rosh Hashanah, the new year, create these pomegranates. I inscribe these blessings 17 times. May you merit the fulfillment of the 18th time, the number that signifies life, this and every new year. We begin in Shabbat and every holiday with candle lighting. These graceful Shabbat candles are created with Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, Woman of Valor. The flames are created using the beautiful blessing for the physical and spiritual health of the family. The halos of light surrounding the flames are the blessings for the children. The halo on the right is the blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh for sons. The left halo, the daughter's blessing of Sarah, Rachel, Rebecca, and Leah. I'm so blessed to bestow these blessings on our children and grandchildren Every week, down the center flows the blessing recited while lighting the Shabbat candles. I mentioned how blessed we feel to live in our home in Israel. This piece, Birkata Bait, Blessing of the Home, is a beautiful view from our dining room window. This is what I see each day as I say my prayers standing at this window facing the direction of Jerusalem. I ask myself, what can I do with this beautiful view? This is it. They dwelt in safety, each man under his vine and under his fig tree. And they built houses and inhabit them. And they planted vineyards and eat the fruit of them. And my chosen ones shall long enjoy the work of their hands, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. May your families and your homes 
be so blessed. The strong and proud eagle. Isaiah 40, comfort, comfort my people. The letters of the word love, ahava, equal the number 13. This entire chapter is written 13 times to create these cliffs and valleys. 13, ahava, God's love for his people. The last verse of the chapter on wings of eagles is written 208 times, creating the eagle. 208 is also divisible by 13, but leaves a remainder of three. The number three in Judaism represents strength, permanence, and that this shall come to pass, amen, which in Hebrew also has three letters. Ezekiel 36, the shofar is blowing, the ruined cities are rebuilt, the fields tilled and sown, the prophecy is coming to life as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's spirits watch over us. Written 50 times, reminding us of the Jubilee year. Looking like an ancient mosaic found in archaeological digs, Jacob's blessing to Judah creates Lion of Judah. The blessing from Genesis is written 100 times. A hundred is a number that represents power. How appropriate for Judah, the future king. There are specific designated blessings for before and after eating food. The blessing after eating bread is the longest. This composition was created using the entire grace after meals recited after eating bread. Originally, this was designed for the cover of the booklets placed on the tables at our oldest daughter's wedding. The Tomb of the Patriarchs, oh, the text is the story of the Machpelah cave. It's purchased by Abraham and the burial of the beloved matriarch Sarah, written here in order to create this powerful image six times. An inscription for each one of our six matriarchs and patriarchs buried here. If you've been to Hebron, you are seeing and walking on living biblical history, just as the artwork represents. This piece is a memorial to all those throughout history who have suffered through the hands of our ever-present enemies. It is specifically for three children, our neighbors, who lost their lives in a terrorist attack in our neighborhood on a Sunday night, two weeks before Purim, February 2002. Throughout the centuries, Jews have prayed for the day when we will return to Israel from all four corners of the earth, when the light of redemption will be upon us. We see the passages from Isaiah, passages that speak of comfort and the day of redemption, forming the people dancing and streaming towards Jerusalem rebuilt, the temple rebuilt. We see the twinkling stars in the sky, reminding us of the blessing the day will come when we will be as many as the stars in the sky. All these passages bring me comfort and peace of mind in difficult times. Psalms 18. King David wrote Psalms 18, Chai, Life, to thank God for teaching him to be victorious in battle. It's a song of deliverance. Just as David rose up successfully against his enemies, this tank represents our present struggle against those who want to destroy us. Psalms 18, 18, which means life, is written three times, which again is a number that represents strength and guidance to successfully fight our enemies. May we always continue to be guided and delivered safely from the battle against those who are determined to destroy us. Blessing Israel. I will bless them that bless you, and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This design is of the famous Israeli cactus, the sabra, in beautiful bloom, prickly and tough on the outside, sweet on the inside, just like Israelis are known to be. This is actually the only piece designed with both Hebrew and English. The almond tree, Jeremiah 1, 11 through 12. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, What do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. And the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I hasten my word to accomplish it. 
As the verses express, Jeremiah saw the branch of an almond tree bear with no bloom, symbolizing the fact that the prophecy God shared with Jeremiah would come to fruition quickly, the destruction of the temple if God's word was not heeded, but also rebuilding in the future. The almond branch in bloom represents the continuation of God's promise and prophecy. When the Jewish nation, Am Yisrael, will bloom, returning from all four corners of the earth to the rebuilt temple and ruined cities rebuilt, may we enjoy the beauty of the blooming almond tree as well as the blooming of the fulfilled prophecies soon in our days. Amen. Dancing for joy, the words from Purim read from the scroll of Esther. Dance across the page, along with these carefree figures representing the joy and fun experienced on this wondrous holiday. This brings the holiday cycle we began full circle, as Purim is one month before Passover. My very first paper cut, surrounded by the ancient fortified walls and magnificent gateways into the city of Jerusalem, the majestic third temple rises. The Ten Commandments, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Verses depicting the land, the Eretz, Zvat, Chalav, Devash, the land flowing with milk and honey, Isaiah 52, awake, awake, put on your strength, Zion, he has redeemed Jerusalem, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Psalms 122, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Isaiah 66, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What house could you build for me? And it shall be that the new moon to new moon and from Shabbat to Shabbat, all flesh shall come to bow down before me. These are part of the microcalligraphy text cut into the delicate thin lines of the filigree weave of stars. My newest piece, the second paper cut, creation. Each day, each heart vibrantly carries us to the next, expressing its individual creation and existence with that day's biblical text, creating the heart's design. Each heart flows from one to the next, bringing us full circle as the cycle of the weeks and seasons evolve. Each week, Shabbat glows golden, full of blessings, centering each of us as we celebrate the gifts God has bestowed on us within the world and universe he created. Now for some fun. Noah, the building of Noah's Ark, and the animals brought on board create these colorful pieces. We all know that the animals were brought on board to weigh two, one male, one female, but it was different for the animals designated as kosher. Seven males, seven female of each of these animals were brought on board. Therefore, the scriptural text is written seven times. I say a prayer first thing in the morning after waking. Moda ani, I give thanks. Thankful for the return of my soul to my body. Many parents recite this short prayer of thanks for their small children each morning, and they recite it with them, as I did with our children, and they now do with theirs. Each night before going to sleep, I say the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. While reciting the first line, traditionally one covers one's eyes in order to concentrate. As you can see here, all the animals are covering their eyes, except for the hippo, who's already sound asleep. Here we have the entire world is a very narrow bridge. The important thing is never to fear. Here you see all the different animals playing together, the giraffe and the elephant creating an amusing bridge. So much to learn from these words and so much to teach our children and each other. The entire book of Jonah read on Yom Kippur is written in all forms of sea creatures, swimming and floating along with Jonah in the welly, in the belly of this frolicking whale. Written three times for the three days and three nights, Jonah's been having a whale of a time. And I've had a whale of a time sharing all of this with you. Many of, may any of these pictorial scriptures that you hang on your wall inspire and strengthen you for years to come. 
so that you don't have to remember everything I've said. With any purchase you make, you receive a full description, more detailed than what I've shared with he- with you here today. Thank you so much, and blessings to you.